On this episode of the podcast, I have with me Vivek Menon. He is the VP and head of cybersecurity and compliance at Digital Turbine. It's going to be an interesting episode because Vivek has a data background and is also a cybersecurity professional. Uh, We're going to talk about how his background has shaped his views on cybersecurity, talking about how he um, likes to set up his program and and drive change. Um, And I'm super excited to have you on, Vivek. Thank you for being on the show. Yeah, thank you, Amir, for having me. Super excited to be on the show as well. Uh, looking forward to our chat for the next 30, 45 minutes. Just very quickly, introduction from my end. Uh, as Amir said, my name is Vivek Menon. Um, I'm the, the head of cybersecurity and IT compliance at Digital Turbine. Now, you might be wondering what Digital Turbine does. We are the, the technical foundation that connects the mobile ecosystem whether it's um, actual mobile phones like Android and iPhone or even like connected devices, which is sort of the next frontier that we are, uh, that we are moving towards. I would list a few things because, uh, they are, you know, our marketing team does a pretty good job of, of emphasizing what we are as a firm. So, so bear with me, um, for that, uh, we innovate the discovery of apps and content. Uh, we provide, uh, services to um, either carriers or or original equipment manufacturers that allows a user to to discover new apps. We elevate user experience. Uh, there are a lot of things we do in app where, like, if you are using a gaming exercise, uh, you're using a gaming app, you can um, you know stay in the app and not have to leave the app while playing the game to get to elevate your experience. Whether that's buying new credits. Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. One of the biggest things we do is we connect an app developer to a publisher, and publisher in this case being publishers who put out advertisement requests, and then advertisers, meaning advertisers who, who put in the ads in those um, uh, in those apps. And then uh, all of this actually means that we are a true partner to a Verizon Sprint. You know all the big carriers, T-Mobile, and so on, as well as like equipment manufacturers like Samsung and other other Android equipment manufacturers. So uh, we like to think that we have a moat because we are first party. We are part of the mobile device to begin with, and so that gives us a lot of, um, I would say, added benefits of you know being part of the ecosystem right from the get go. And uh, we are excited about where you know our next few years will be. But yeah, that's a little bit about, about Digital Turbine. Uh, I'll quickly wrap up by sort of giving my profile as well. I've been with DTE for the last seven months, uh, close to close to eight months now. Before that, I was in, in leadership roles in cybersecurity at uh, JP Morgan Chase out here in, in Dallas, Texas. And then before JP Morgan, I was with another financial services company, Capital One, part of their cybersecurity leadership team as well. But as as Amir mentioned, um, I sort of made my way into cyber through data. So I have like probably a bulk of my career was has still been in data. I've, I've recently shifted to cyber around seven, eight years ago. So again, looking forward to sort of bringing all that back into how uh, it has led to me being here. Absolutely. Now, oh, thank you for that. And yeah, the topic, obviously, you know, we want to talk about some of that, you know, data convergence. Uh, with your cybersecurity uh, you know, day job for the last five, six years, at least. And obviously there's a lot of data implications in security. I mean, it's all, it's all data. So I'd imagine someone with your background um, who understands data engineering and has a background of building those data solutions might you know, benefit. I, I guess let's maybe, maybe just talk about that. So, you don't see a ton of cybersecurity professionals that come through the data ranks as much, maybe if they're you know, within privacy or, or, or data governance, perhaps. But but in terms of cybersecurity, being a CISO, it's a little bit less common. Uh, I guess, why do you think that path is less taken in general? Why do data people don't you know make that side step to security as, as, as often as maybe they should? So I think it, it, it has to... As, um, somewhat go back to how cybersecurity was viewed previously. A lot of cybersecurity was uh, equated to compliance in the years past. And so that naturally led to people who were you know, focused more on IT general controls, for example, for public firms or have had a career in, in privacy or for that matter, even uh, even legal. Uh, there, are, there are many organizations even today where the, the the CISO or the head of cybersecurity resides within the, the legal organization. 
Uh, and so it goes back to how the evolution of security has happened in that particular form. But in general, that's where most of the CISOs came from, I would say, 10 years ago. What you would see today in, in today's world, a lot of the automation that has come through in cybersecurity is around automated data collection, security automation, you know, the, the rise of the SIMs and the SOARs, all abbreviations that most people in security are, are pretty uh, well versed with. All of that has come about because today we can collect data at a scale that was not thought of or thinkable like five years ago. Not only that, but um, aggregate it to a, a, to a degree that it, the data becomes meaningful and then analyze it. But before sort of I, I go down that route, let me sort of share, share a story. It would be much more, I would say, consumable for, for your audience, right? Almost two decades ago, maybe more than that now, I started my career as a ETL developer, which is Extract, Transform, Load. And you know this that's sort of the bread and butter of what a data engineer would do in today's age, right? You extract the data, you transform the data based on business needs, and then you load the data. So did that for a, for a good amount of years, like four or five years, learned a ton about how to do ETL, extract, transform, load. And then sort of made my way into data consulting. I went to business school at UT Austin, yeah, in Austin. And through that, I got into consulting with Ernst Young. But I stayed true to my data roots. A lot of the management problems we were solving were essentially data problems. The reporting was not there. There was no uh, belief in the data that was collecting. Uh, a very common term that's used in the data world is uh, one source of truth. That didn't exist for many of my clients. So my role was to go in and sort of build that data governance program, collect the data, uh, establish what was called as a one source of truth, and then use that to drive reporting that these executives could use to make, make decisions. So that was my evolution. And then fast forward, that got me into Capital One. I was still focused on, on data, specifically building big data on cloud. And so when cloud came about, specifically AWS with Capital One, we pretty much all of us had to learn everything from scratch, including data security on cloud. And alien concept, the shared accountability model was not something that was that people were well versed with or well understood even. And for us to begin to storing financial data on cloud was a uh, uh, was a big deal. And so we had to self teach ourselves uh, a lot of cloud security roles, which today is you know a whole bunch of tools. But at that back six seven years ago, you had to write your own scripts. So that was my gradual introduction into, uh, I would say, cloud security, being part of the data organization. Now, what really flipped the switch was uh, the, the cybersecurity issues that we were having in the organization were pr predominantly data collection. Like we were doing a lot of operational work and we were not using data to drive decisions at a higher level and make our um, access management better make our vulnerability management better and so on. So that led to the CIO, the divisional CIO, asking me to sort of take on uh, additional responsibilities around cybersecurity, focusing on identity and access management and vulnerability management. I think that was a, I, I think it was a great story to kind of kind of see that evolution. I was going to ask you because, you know, as you came up through the ranks through data and you learned security, so uh, data security is a good fit with each other. When you look at other peers in the industry who who necessarily don't you know come through data and you see you know how they view data and 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 the relationship to security, obviously the core core business is to protect the data, right? Keeping people out, but really is to keep them from getting to the data for the most part. It seems like it's a big core. Like you would think that this is this would be a maybe a natural progression to move to data, to data security, and then into a CISO position. Like is it because it's new? You mentioned it's new, like security, you know, from previous days to now has, has evolved. Is it because it's new and we just haven't connected the dots or is it just, you know, just non-traditional and just it is what it is? I think it's because it's new. Um, there is an aspect of it being non-traditional as well. But just to pull uh, pull further the thread I was mentioning previously, a lot of previous CISOs had, they were essentially good security engineers that then evolved into CISO roles and, and sort of made their way into the executive ranks and so on. And a lot of those good security engineers build their credentials on essentially network security. 
So that part of the equation, they knew really, really well. But as cloud became that much more critical, and the fact that we are now generating a whole lot more data than what we were like 10 years ago, like you know, there is some stat out there that we pretty much double the data every year, right? Like on a yearly basis. So that has, I would say, tilted the, the equation a little bit in, in terms of people who come with a data background. Like if you understand how to protect data on cloud, and if you understand like building that single source of truth, whether it's knowing where your vulnerabilities are, where your, your high and critical risks are, or from a compliance point of view, like where your access uh, issues are, I think that drives today's CISOs a whole lot more than it, it used to in the years past. And so you, I, 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 you know, I, this is not like a Nostradamus-like prediction, but I do think that you would see a lot more individuals, you know, having backgrounds such as myself, eventually sort of making their way into the the, the C-suite as well from a you know a security point of view. Yeah, interesting. I mean, I just, you know, I, yeah, obviously we can't predict the future, but it is interesting that, and yeah, obviously that the traditional security through the network security. Uh, infrastructure security side, obviously you have the data security side as well. Do you think the CISO role could be broken up into different pieces? I mean, obviously like, you know, data security is a very specialized component of security, obviously network and cloud security. You know, it's a little messy. The cloud cloud has made things messy to pull them apart and build, you know, clear lines. But do you ever envision maybe the CISO role is more absorbed into the actual functional roles and, and not an actual like specific title? I think we are still early in how the CISO role is viewed at the C-suite level for it to go back into what I would call like the functional levels. Mm -hmm. This this happens, it's almost cyclical. This happens with the, you know, the the accounting group, the, the financial group, you know, quite quite often. But what, what is like what is termed as like federated versus non-federated. Like non-federated means like it's centrally managed, federated means like the, the business units or, or groups are so big that they eventually need to have their own people who focus on data security, vulnerability, and so on. So uh, I think we're still too early in the getting to the federated model. Now, there is there are exceptions as with everything else in life. Bigger organizations are already there, but the necessity of what drives that is essentially their scale. So a lot of business units, like, you know, a huge, I would say Fortune 50 organizations, a lot of them have like, you know, divisional ISOs or DSOs, information security officers. They have uh, business information security officers. Then there is the field CISO, which if you're a product company, you know, the field CISO will go out and talk about your the security of your product and so on. So we are seeing an evolution of that in various formats, but overall, like, it, would this be something that is a pattern that's adopted by a majority of the of the firms? I think we are still a little bit early in that uh, in that curve. Yeah, that's interesting. I, I, I mean, it makes a lot of sense. Obviously, uh, early days, let alone you know, the skill sets are already hard to find to to kind of segregate it. Especially you know the the, the cloud integration and the cloud vulnerability side of this. I guess a question for you: uh, you, you come to to security with this background in data when you talk to other colleagues in the industry, other peers, you know, other security leaders, and you kind of look at how you have built your program and how you view your program. Is there a fundamental difference in how you view a security program? Obviously, I know there's protocols and frameworks that everyone abides by, but just like from a personal standpoint, because you do have that data background, is there is there a difference in how you see things? I do. Uh, the first One of the first things that I actually did is how much data can we collect on a regular basis that is trustworthy that we can then show to a wider audience to drive uh, behavior change? Because um, today, um, not, not necessarily talking about my current firm, but many of the firms that have been uh, in otherwise as well, we tend to sort of um, place a lot of emphasis on hearsay and anecdotal evidence where like I don't think our email security is appropriate or I don't think we do a user access review at the consistency at which we should do, et cetera, et cetera. But a lot of the data is available. Now, it's just a matter of whether we want to in a, spend the time collecting that data in a fashion that is actually consumable. So when I came in, I certainly sort of emphasize that aspect where I like I have a dashboard today that I leverage on a, on a bi-weekly basis 
to drive discussions not only with my team but also my peers because if you can't you can't um, you can't manage what you can't measure and so for that i, I need to know that uh, that we're making progress and a lot of that again sort of tied back to your previous question goes back to some of the innovations that have happened in cybersecurity like the the cloud security posture management tool we use is agentless so i don't have to necessarily worry about like who's spinning up what instance by in, in which account because it's done through the the overall organizational account it gets picked up by the agentless cspm tool cloud security posture management tool and i have that data handy as soon as i log into the the dashboard and i use that information and the trends coming from that to drive what the devops team should be looking at what the site reliability team should be looking at etc it's a metric that i am accountable for in terms of vulnerability management but the responsibility of that is shared so i my goal is to put in the processes together shine the right amount of light on it on how quickly we should make progress why is it critical triage it and so on but then work with my peers on on the devops and sre side to ensure that you know it's it gets taken care of and and we are mitigating that risk for the firm but uh, yeah that's a little bit of an evolution that uh, that i sort of brought in uh, coming into my role Absolutely. And I know, you know, digital trip and obviously, um, you know, we start touching, you know, some of the ad tech components and, you know, I was, I was just thinking as you're talking, you have this data background, you know, ad tech and mobile, uh, tons of data, tons of discussions around, you know, privacy and, and whatnot, as you've kind of come into this role, I mean, and, and just, uh, you know, as the time of this recording, you've been there about eight months, just so that everyone's aware, um, you bring the, the previous experience, Capital One, you know, JP Morgan Chase, as you're kind of looking at the current role and using some of the previous tools, obviously you have that data centric view. Uh, what have you been trying to accomplish given, you know, it's a different industry. Um, you do have a little bit of a you know, non-typical background. Um, how, how, I guess, what are some of the, I guess, high level objectives moving into this role that you're hoping to, to achieve? Yeah, so uh, there were a couple of them and I'll, I'll list them out. Uh, I think number one, I would say, is to be a trusted business advisor. You know, uh, security gets a bad rep that they are the folks who say no to everything. And there is some truth to it, no doubt. But I think that 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 mentality has also evolved. And I was very, I would say, focused on not bringing that mentality over to uh, to my to my current employer. So building those relationships with the the presidents of the business units, the sales teams, and collaborating with them in ensuring how security can be a business enabler was top of the agenda for me. And they were, they, we have had some good wins. Like, you know, we also do business with a lot of big providers and obviously they have their own security requirements. So someone like me coming in, like sort of taking them through what we have done, our profile and how do we implement controls, that generates a lot of goodwill for the firm. And they feel like, hey, if there is some data exchange with, with, this, with this company, uh, we are in good hands because they have the right amount of controls and, and, and the right uh, personnel involved in this as well. So that's number one. Second, uh, a lot of my focus and time is spent on education. And education is at every level. Um, we are a public firm. So I spend time bringing the board up to speed on what our critical risk areas are, what, what we have done over the last quarter, because it's a quarterly update, and what, what we see, like where are we going in the next two quarters, and how, how does that play a role in mitigating the overall risk profile um, for, for DT. So it's educating the board, it's educating the executive team. This is a team that you know has come together uh, through um, various acquisitions. You know, a lot of a lot of them were startups, etc. So while all of them are good technical, you know, solid technical engineers and product people, security is something that needs to be um, talked about to be top of the mind for them. So I've conducted forums where I specifically talk about it. I do fireside chats. And I did one with my CFO and the president of one of our business unit, specifically because I wanted somebody who is responsible for making money, and which is the president, and then the CFO who's responsible for ensuring that everything ticks and ties from a budget point of view, et cetera. And sort of hear their views about security and why it's important for the organization. So conducting those kind of fireside chats also provides an opportunity for me to educate not only the executives, 
but then um, you know our employee base as well. And then staying on the education topic, like th- there is a lot a lot of effort that we put in uh, on uh, educating our employees. We send out weekly newsletters for the Cybersecurity Awareness Month. We align them with what uh, CISA was recommending around the topics. And then now we are conducting what is called as a, a cybersecurity awareness proficiency assessment. Essentially, it's an assessment, not, not a training. Given what, what they read about and what they heard about in October, like where do they think their level of knowledge is about general cybersecurity awareness? And then once we get the results back in, in, in a few weeks' time, the goal is to use that to drive further personalized training needs for the organization. But you know, education is sort of the number two topic for me. Um, and then third, I would say there is a lot of tool sprawl. As it is, there is a lot of tool sprawl in the in the cybersecurity industry. But given that we are we have come together as multiple different firms through acquisitions, some of those tools were overlapping. Some of those tools were you know uh, were not meeting our needs as an enterprise organization now. So focusing on that and ensuring that we streamline what tools will meet our future needs and sort of doubling down on that and sort of, uh, I would say, clearing up some of the other aspects of uh, tools that we don't necessarily have to manage given we have something better that that meets our, our requirements. So that's been the other focus that I have. So that's the, the one, two, three for me. Yeah, I guess when you mentioned, uh, yeah, obviously you're you're a big data guy, you know, you like to see the data and not just uh, hearsay. Um, as a part of that uh, culture, and you know that you know, you're focused on that data, providing the metrics. I guess how does your team deliver those? Just out of curiosity, if it's all internal, are you partnering with the data team, or how how does that actually get out? A lot of it is tools that we have, um, you know, at hand. So I talked about an agentless cloud security posture management tool. We have an endpoint protection tool as well. Uh, multiple tools that we gather data from. Then we use a particular tool for. Um, Collecting our risk management, uh, like you know, high critical, critical high, medium, low risk, and then another tool for our um, ITGC compliance uh, metrics as well. So all of those tools are something that we have access to directly, and we can leverage the data in those tools. Are actually not something that we we own per se. Are owned by some of our our, our peer organizations. But we have agreed to on a process with them that the the only source of truth is that tool. So we would stick to that and we would keep using that to manage progress. The goal is we don't necessarily, I would say, um, emphasize on what the data today tells us or what's the point in time data. We talk about the trend. We say like last month it was this, are we doing better from last month? And so if you have made progress on it, the source of data and the accuracy of data, there is some amount of leeway that you can have in that as long as you know you're, you're trending in the right direction. Then I sort of aggregate that information as I present to the, the executives and the board and so on. Awesome. I was actually thinking um, you probably sit in a very interesting spot to, to give advice because um, obviously you made the journey yourself. But if, so, if somebody you know, is in data, you know, kind of had a similar path to your, you know, in the data engineering space, it could be other parts of data. It could be analytics, it could be anything, but their interest in security, obviously in your case, the opportunity kind of just presented itself. You, you know, you, you kind of grabbed it, which is good. But if somebody does see some of that overlap, you know, maybe they work in data governance, they, you know, they, they deal with some of that kind of stuff. Like how would you start shifting your career just out of curiosity? Um, that's maybe a good takeaway. If someone's listening who is like, Hey, I I'm in data. I'd like to go to security. Yeah, I would say cloud data security, the number one reason or, or the number one avenue for you to actually make that switch. Data security has evolved on the cloud, um, you know, with uh, incremental progress being made by the cloud service providers, as well as a whole host of tools that have come along. But we still are, I would say, there are a lot of uh, guardrails that are not followed by mature organizations. So even understanding how data sits differently in the cloud, understanding how key management works, what scenarios do we use keys uh, and protect our data, in what scenarios do we rely on a a provider, uh, a cloud service provider provided keys, and so on. Like those things are so critical. And somebody who has that in-depth data storage knowledge 
we can probably talk about uh, at length how to encrypt at rest, how to encrypt in motion, how to encrypt in use. And if you are looking to sort of make your way into security, I think data security is a, is a fabulous, fabulous way to do that. And then um, second tip I would say is around privacy. EU GDPR sort of gets uh, gets brought up as the, the 800 pound gorilla. And, and so it should, because that's what sort of uh, led everybody else, every other organization or, or state or country to sort of take it seriously. And, and you're seeing the effects of that. Like there are like five privacy laws in the US that are coming online uh, on January 1st. But if you, are, if you get well versed around it, and if you are able to get some certification, both on the data security piece, as well as on privacy, on to be even more specific, I would say on data security, like AWS and GCP, they both have data security speciality and uh, our security speciality, sorry. And so if you focus on that and get that, which will take some time, even though if you have worked in cloud, that is a, a big, big, I would say door opener for you. And then on the privacy side, there is an organization called CIPP and they do both EU specific certifications as well as uh, US specific, uh, so specifically uh, uh, too many specifics, but the California one. And those things I think will, will, will be a massive boost to any resume as you sort of think about moving away from data and just focusing on security. I like that. Yeah, I mean, obviously the the, the data of your privacy aspect. Um, yeah, I, I was going to touch on that. I was just curious to get your thoughts. Obviously, a couple more laws coming online. It's evolving. Your background in data. How how close do you stay to that component? Because uh, obviously, it it probably fits your 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 profile. Yeah. So uh, the the I would say the overarching nonprofit group in advertising technology is called Interactive Advertising Bureau or IAB. And uh, as part of the role that Digital Turbine plays in this space, I'm part of their security working group. Uh, and we meet on a, on a weekly basis. We talk about all things security and privacy. And um, given what's coming up uh, you know, in, in, a, in the next few weeks with like five different privacy laws coming online, that's been sort of the, the, the deep dives that we have been doing. Um, so a lot of intense conversations around this, right? Like we, uh, all the firms want to do what's, what's right, what's appropriate, ensure that we are compliant to the laws, et cetera, et cetera. But there is a lot to unpack. And so by being part of these this industry forums, we are able to get together all the experts, people who have similar issues, um, and sort of get them to talk about how to tackle this at a holistic level, as opposed to like every firm going at it you know, uh, in their own capacity. So yeah, th those kind of conversations are happening, and, and there's some... A good amount of headway that has already happened, and uh, the entire industry is is benefiting from it. Awesome, man. Um, I was going to say, I mean, I think your background's kind of unique, and I was hoping to kind of cover that with you, since um, you know I don't see it a lot. Uh, I do have some cybersecurity professionals on, and um, thought thought it was thought it'd be really cool. So I I appreciate you coming on and sharing. Thank you for that. Of course, yeah, yeah. I'm I'm, I'm glad I could um, come on, like, kind of spend this time. Awesome, man. So I, I guess before I let you go, I always like to ask uh, each guest uh, this to get their thoughts. But you know, I'd like to, to see if, if you could have a future guest cover a topic for the show um, that you'd like to hear about. What, what topic would you like to, to see on the show? Yeah, so this is uh, this is a little bit specific, but uh, I, I w it would be interesting if uh, you know if you can find somebody to uh, to talk about this. So for public firms, there is you know, this financial compliance, and then there is IT general control compliance, and um, how it's handled in organizations is very different, right? Because overall SOX compliance sort of resides in in the financial organization. But the responsibility of ensuring adherence to um, IT general controls is with the security organizations and so on, right? Um, I would be interested to know from you know from future guests, uh, specifically people who are, who are working for public firms, how is it handled? What are the best practices that that they can recommend for somebody like like me? And like how do you how do they see this evolving in the future? Uh, because ITGC is going to sort of you know start gaining more and more prominence in terms of overall controls. And so it might be something that, um, you know, uh, takes a shape of its own. Absolutely. Yeah. If somebody, if, if that's somebody's background, uh, I think, you know, I'm sure that's a topic other people love to hear. So reach out to me, let me know. I'd love to have somebody on the show to talk about that. Um, and if somebody wants to get in touch with you, just 
to talk about anything you mentioned on the show, what how would be what would be a good way of reaching out to you? Yeah, so best way to reach out to me would be on LinkedIn. Uh, if you search for uh, Vivek, that's V I V E K. My middle name S and Menon, uh, M E N O N. The S is important because it's it's somewhat of a common name. So if you add the S, you will directly land on my profile. Uh, but yeah, happy to connect. Happy to talk about what we just discussed here. Um, I'm sure there are a lot of uh, like-minded and kindred souls out there that uh, can that we can you know uh, I can connect with and, and mutually benefit. Absolutely, we'll put th- we'll put that in the show notes to to help people find it. Um, Vivek, thanks for being on. I appreciate it. Likewise, thank you, Amir. Thank you, everyone. Awesome. That's it for this episode. We'll be back again, different topic, different guest. Um, you know, I always ask if, if obviously you know someone that could talk to Vivek's uh, podcast topic, please reach out. Love to have you on. And secondly, you know, if you like the podcast, please share it with somebody else. Um, that's how the whole thing's grown so far. And and also, if you could, you know, drop a rating um, on Apple or Google or wherever you listen to the podcast, that's great because that's how that's how the game's won. Um, but I appreciate everyone who does that every week. But that's it for this week. Be back again. Thank you. And goodbye. <laughs>